So somewhat recently, I have been taking a look at some of the Bionicle movies. I watched The Mask of Light a lot as a kid, but on rewatch, I didn't enjoy it as much. There were too many problems in my eyes, and I legitimately didn't enjoy watching it again. I was curious about some of the other movies, and decided to at least watch the initial trilogy of movies. I watched the second movie, and found that I did not like it at all, and found it to be even worse than the first one. The video where I talked about that was probably the fastest I ever gained views for a video, jumping from 6 views to over 50 within 24 hours and it slowly climbed up even more after that. On the flip side, people didn't like it all that much. I've been judging the quality of Bionicle overall from the quality of the movies. Apparently this was the wrong way to be thinking. I really, genuinely want to thank Vrano for correcting me on some info regarding the films and explaining more about Bionicle to me. The movies are the worst way to experience what Bionicle has to offer. Inconsistencies to the rest of the lore, actual mistakes, Changes that completely deviate from canon, these movies are more of a mess than just surface level quality. I did decide to do some more research, and I have to admit, Bionicle has some dope lore. Some of it is dumb and convoluted and confusing, but it can be fucking awesome too. I do still think that it's too late for me to become a fan, since there's too much information for me to try and catch up on, so I may be a lost cause in that regard. But if you like Bionicle, that's fucking great! I do kind of regret basing my thoughts on the franchise as a whole solely from the movies, and I do apologize and rescind my statement from the end of that video. Bionicle didn't deserve to die. This all being said though, I am not going to take much, if any, of this info into my viewing of the third movie. I want to be fair and not use newly acquired info to change my perspective on this film. I am going to view this movie blind as I did with the last one. I don't want to have any biases when watching this now that I have been corrected. Please keep in mind two things before continuing to watch. One, this is only my opinion. If you don't agree with it, that's fine, but don't be nasty. Stay civil. Two, even after all this new info, my previous thoughts on the other two movies have not changed. The way I feel about those is the same. Keep this all in mind. If I do refer to other Bionicle media, it will only be the other two movies I've seen, in order to be consistent. <sighs> okay, so with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the last Bionicle movie that I'll be watching. Bionicle, Web of Shadows. So the movie starts off by intentionally trolling me. I'm already liking this start way better. Don't worry about rocks once again, thank god. FUCKING GOD! Gather the friends. <laughs> Listen again to our legend uh, of the Bionicle. In the time before time, six mighty Toa vanquished the Makuta, encasing him in protodermis, held tight by the force of their combined elemental powers. It's reusing footage, but at least they're they showing stuff this time. It is more of what I wanted, though, in that it actually shows visuals, even if it is just a recap of the last movie. And apparently this movie is placed in a weird point in the timeline, and that it takes place in between the final battle of the last movie and the movie's ending on the beach. I'm... not sure how to feel about that. In any case, before getting into the movie proper, I want to give praise to the atmosphere and tone of this film. Even though it's not scary in the slightest, this film does have much more of a creamy atmosphere than the previous two films, and the overall tone is much more serious as well. There are still a few dumb bits of humor, but some of the humor did manage to actually get a small chuckle out of me. I legitimately like it. But, for the movie proper, it starts with our six Toa looking for the Matoran after the events of the last movie. Bokama is shown to be much more confident and cocky from beating Makuta, and this begins to divide with the other Toa, especially Matau. In fact, this movie is definitely more about the relationship between all the Toa, especially between Bokama and Matau. The character dynamics between the Toa are the major focus of the plot, with the big threat kind of just being there to give a reason for the conflict. While it feels kind of forced, it works for this movie, and actually makes you more invested in the plot, since just having another big bad to stop and no other conflict would have been boring. Matau is still technically the comic relief like the last film, but his humor is now more cold and snarky and egotistical as opposed to Duh, he slammed the object for 700th fucking time. <laughs> oh my god, good to know green Rama. ones in every generation are some of the most annoying ones. Oh my god. Vakama himself goes through an interesting, if a bit pointless, arc, but I'll get into that a bit later. 
In any case, the total get captured and we are introduced to our new villains, Cedarak and especially Rudaka. Cedarak is designed to seem like the main villain, even though his voice is a bit off to me. Means the Toa have already it's been... like someone's trying to do like a deep, dark devil voice, but has a cold. I am Satan, bow down to me. It's really amazing. However, Rudaka is definitely the true villain, and is a great character. Oof. Oof a oh, she's leading him on big time. Oof. Bring me their bodies. Is there eye twitching? <laughs> what? <laughs> Gee, I wonder if this character's crazy. She's very cunning and manipulative, and just loves being evil. She's a commanding villain, and the best villain of this trilogy. I love how slimy she is, and even though she isn't really a physically imposing threat, she manages to accomplish everything without getting into a physical fight with the main Toa. You know that she is a good villain when she actually manages to achieve her goal. My main problem with her though is her motivation. Her main goal is to revive Makuta. Instead of having her own reason for wanting to rule the world, she just wants to bring the last bad guy back and we never get a real reason why. Kinda wish she had a goal to herself, since this is a big blemish to her character. Makuta's got a fuck buddy? Toa? In any case, despite the fact that all of our heroes were easily captured, they just as easily escape, and get new designs so bad that even the cast hates them. They are rescued by some elders, and are given explanations as to what they have changed into, and what to do in order to cure themselves. However, some Toa still don't think that Vakama is a worthy leader, and because of this, we get an interesting development for Vakama. Vakama becomes a primary antagonist for a while, and the way they go about it is actually kind of well done. Due to a combination of his fading self-confidence, some Toa verbally attacking him, Rudaka getting into his head, and the poison affecting his body, Vakama joins the evil side. I like this! It creates quite the divide in the group when your main leader is gone, and it can help with character moments and character development for multiple characters. And it does do that! It also brings back what happened to Tahu in the first movie, and not only does it well, but now it actually has a purpose in the plot. It gets solved a little faster than I would have liked, but whatever. So now the main plot focuses around both getting Vakama back, and curing themselves before rescuing the Matoran. And this movie actually takes its time with it. This movie is much slower paced, and while it can be boring, it was never annoying. And if you're wondering why I'm going over my critiques more than I'm talking about the plot moments bit by bit like the last couple of times, it's because the one downside to slower pacing is that not really much of anything actually happens worth of note yet. It's more building up to the third act. But I guess I'll speedrun this really quickly from where I left off. Vakama leaves the group and is captured. Rudaka gets into his head. The Toa look for Kitongu. Vakama attacks the elders and then joins Cedarak. And then eventually the Toa find Kitongu, who tells them that their whole quest to find him is pointless. I don't even need to criticize this, the movie does it itself. So, we've come all this way just to find out we didn't have to come all this way! <laughs> he thinks it's funny too. <laughs> all right, funny! That's what I was thinking. The main goal of the Toa is now just stopping the villains and saving Vakama. <sighs> Jeez, either I'm describing this movie in a poor way, or their main goal really does seem to change frequently. This leads to a big action scene, where the Toa try to show off why there should have been a Bionicle Dynasty Warriors game. Kitongu kind of, sort of, faces off against Rudaka and Cedarak, and Rudaka manages to take out two birds with one stone. She knocks Kitongu off the tower, and then gets Kitongu to kill Cedarak. God, she is so close to being a legit great villain. So close! Also in this fight, Matau faces off against Vakama, and the movie finally does something that I've been asking for since the first one. The Toa actually use their melee weapons like real melee weapons! For about five seconds. I feel so blue balled. Throughout the fight, Matao tries to get Sasuke up uh, Vakama back to their side, and even though Matao has been nothing but aggressive towards Vakama this whole time, he manages to win him back over. Progression? Hang on. 
I've got a plan. That was a very evil delivery. Now he's back to being good. Don't you ever guys. I'm here to stay. That was a very evil delivery for, for being back to good now. <laughs> This is kind of what I mean by saying that it ends rather fast. Besides the poison and new bestial nature of his new form, Fukama kind of had a good reason to lead to Toa, and Matao didn't seem to have much faith in him until the final battle. And he just comes back to his senses because of unity, duty, and destiny. That's it. So now that Fukama is good again, and the Toa are all back together, it's time for the final showdown with Rudaka. And I already said that she wins back in my analysis of her earlier in this video, so no need to beat around the bush. She wins. Well, she still dies and the entire enemy army is gone, but her main goal is to revive Makuta and in dying, achieve that goal, so she still wins. I would have personally liked to see some action scene with her in the Toa, or at least her versus Vakama, but she was more of a schemer than a fighter, so it works. And Vakama does give a legit good message about the difference between being a leader and a tyrant. Traitors! You can't betray someone you're enslaved to. And to think I thought you could be king. I lead only those that choose to follow. That's the difference between being a leader and a tyrant like you. So the Toa turned back to normal and rescued the Matoran and had to prepare for the inevitable return of Makuta. And this being both a prequel and midquel, we know what happens to Makuta and this movie can't really affect anything since it takes place before the end of the previous movie which is my biggest problem with this movie. Since it's placed in between scenes from the end of the last movie, everyone needs to be where they were before this movie to preserve continuity, and because of that, this whole movie feels pointless. While it does add more depth to the characters and the world a bit, this movie not existing would change nothing, and placing it in a different point in time probably would have worked in its favor to make a much more entertaining movie that has lasting ramifications. The story is mostly self-contained though, which is nice. Overall, this movie was just kind of bland. There are quite a few things that work and I actually like, but it appeals very by the books and nothing of real note seems to happen. It isn't bad, but it's not particularly good either. It just is. It exists. And I guess for the trilogy overall and what it did, or more accurately should have done for the IP, I do still believe that these movies had the potential to introduce people to the world in a better way. While I'll always hate the whole idea of getting your answers for one thing from seven other things, even in franchises I like, when it's in a long running series like this, you don't really have a choice. Nothing wrong with having your IP in multiple forms of media, but having to track down or find some obscure game, movie, book, interview, region exclusive thing for clarification is something that will always irk me. The movies, even if they are the worst way to be introduced to the franchise, is still a way to be introduced, and it would have been more beneficial to capitalize on that. Movies, especially around the time of the early 2000s, would have been one of the best ways to reach a wider audience than books or comics. Ideally, the movie should be simple, yet interesting enough to warrant more investment from the viewer to look more into the franchise. The movies should be a good viewing experience either as a standalone product, or as a connected story to draw interest then let the other outlets expand on that interest. So the fact that the movies didn't manage to do that is a legit problem, but that's all pretty much moot at this point. So while the movie is just an incredibly average film in my opinion, My Uncle itself is still an interesting IP, and if you're a fan of it, be proud of that. Now, me personally, I'm never touching this series in a public way ever again. Okay, where'd this awesome song come from? I was literally just about to wrap up and stop recording. Where did this awesome song come from? What the fuck? <laughs> what? Why is this the most surprising thing I've seen in this trilogy? I mean, I don't know if this song is good, but I just didn't expect a rock song out of nowhere. <laughs> I, I'm gonna stop before they might copyright this for whatever reason. Okay, well. Uh. <laughs> Bullshit.